We're going to start off with session seven, which is on uh, the uh, global impact of Tony. Uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Yoshi Maeno from uh, Kyoto, and uh, I turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, happy birthday, Tony. Yes. It's a great honor uh, for me to uh, be able to speak in this occasion. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dale and the other organizers for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity. Yes. And uh, uh, this is the uh, photo of the uh, cherry blossoms on campus of Kyoto University taken this week before my departure from Kyoto. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, the celebration at the age of 80 is very uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, and uh, we call uh, uh, this uh, uh, celebration as Sanju. And San means uh, umbrella. So we are all in a big, under the big umbrella of Tony. And the uh, abbreviation of this Chinese character is this. And the top part, this one, meaning eight. And the bottom part is 10. So you see why umbrella could mean 80. And then Ju is the uh, celebration of the long, long life. And somebody mentioned uh, uh, we may need to wait 10 more years uh, for another celebration. But that's not the case in Asia. Uh, so this is the lineup of the uh, celebration. Uh, so Sanju is here. Okay. And the next one will be uh, Beiju, 88. And then you have 90, 99, 100, and so on. OK, so when are you coming up? <coughs> uh, maybe lucky numbers, yeah. This uh, 77 is uh, this is a Chinese character uh, containing this uh, seven, two sevens, and eight is uh, this, you see, this is eight. Rice is uh, sort of eight. And then now uh, white is. Uh, uh, 100, Chinese character 100 minus one stroke, so that's 99. Okay, so, <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, Tony uh, spent uh, uh, one year uh, as a postdoc here uh, in uh, 1994 and 95 at uh, Urbana Champagne. And then right after this, he still had one more year left for the fellowship. And he chose uh, Kyoto University uh, for the final year of the postdoc. And uh, so this was the one year after the Tokyo Olympics. <clears throat> and uh, I was uh, born in Kyoto. And at that time, I was uh, seven or eight years old. And I was, my home was uh, about two miles from the uh, Kyoto University, uh, near the uh, Daitokuji Temple, the Zen Temple. So we, we were living in the same city at that time. <laughs> right. And then uh, the host at Kyoto University was uh, uh, Matsubara. Takeo Matsubara, and uh, he's uh, well known for the Matsubara Green Function. And his paper was uh, published in 1955, 10 years before uh, uh, Tony uh, joined uh, as a postdoc. <coughs> and at that time, the uh, physics department was under construction, extension. So therefore, uh, he had, uh, Tony has his office at the Yukawa Institute, which is two minutes walk from the uh, physics department. And uh, this is a Yukawa Institute. And this is a statue of Yukawa. And Tomonaga and Yukawa were classmates at Kyoto University. And uh, okay. then uh, this is a paper uh, he wrote uh, while he was in Kyoto. The uh, uh, number phase uh, fluctuation in two band superconductors. And this was published in Progress on Theoretical Physics. Uh, uh, edited, uh, published from Yukawa Institute. And uh, this Matsubara paper or Kubo paper, those are published in this uh, Japanese journal. And then uh, this paper uh, refers to the, uh, the contents, this uh, idea of a collecti collective excitation uh, corresponding to small fluctuation of the relative phase of two, two condensates. So if you have a two-band superconductor with uh, rather independent uh, wave functions, and then uh, they, they have an uh, equal phase. Uh, but uh, then there's a collective excitation involving the phase fluctuation between the two condensates. And then I saw the acknowledgment, uh, Matsubara, and also among the uh, acknowledged people are Tsuneto. And uh, Toshihiko Tsuneto is one of my teachers. Uh, and uh, he uh, spent one year at uh, here 
uh, as a postdoc or a Baudin. So maybe some of you may remember uh, Tsuneto, no? That time? <laughs> okay, anyway, so Tuneto and Matsuara are both my, my teachers uh, when I was undergraduate at Kyoto. <clears throat> and then, uh, after uh, 40 years, or, uh, or 50 years, uh, uh, 40 years, yes, there's uh, this paper uh, uh, referring to this uh, uh, Leggett's uh, collective mode uh, on uh, MGB2. And MGB2 is a 39 Kelvin superconductor. And it consists of uh, this uh, sigma band and pi band with the quite different character. So they can be considered as a S plus S, uh, S wave superconductor. And uh, so they, they found this, uh, uh, this uh, Leggett mode uh, uh, in the Raman spectrum. Uh, below this, uh, uh, between the two uh, superconducting gap, they have this particular Raman mode uh, show, show this uh, additional uh, collective mode. So this was uh, 40 years after this uh, Tony's paper. And then 10 years later, uh, 50 years uh, since uh, his paper, uh, there's a, this a theoretical proposal on uh, strontium-2 ricinium-04. The authors are uh, Scafidi and Sigrist and Catherine uh, Cunning. And uh, uh, when is uh, Catherine's uh, student? And so they published this paper uh, two years ago, predicting the uh, uh, collective legate mode uh, in uh, strontium ricinate. And here, this uh, uh, bronze and uh, silver are uh, quasi one dimensional band, and this uh, gold is uh, uh, quasi two dimensional band. So uh, it's believed that uh, there are uh, two distinct uh, condensates, essentially. And uh, between these, uh, uh, the phase oscillations between the two kinds of bands, uh, they predicted this uh, uh, legate mode, collective excitations. That hasn't been uh, observed uh, yet. Then, uh, next time uh, he visited uh, uh, Japan for a long time is, uh, is 1973. So this was uh, right after the discovery of helium-3 superconductivity. Uh, this is uh, for three months uh, he spent uh, in, in the, at the University of Tokyo. And uh, he gave a, a series of uh, lectures on, uh, uh, on the new phase of, uh, new phase of liquid helium-3. And this is the uh, uh, note uh, uh, taken by uh, graduate students of the University of Tokyo at that time. And uh, this is not a translation, okay, because it says uh, lectures are given in Japanese. So, so you gave a lecture in Japanese. So then uh, the, uh, the student who, who sort of uh, uh, organized this is uh, uh, Takagi. Is Takagi. And, uh, Takagi-san uh, became a postdoc uh, of uh, uh, Tony at the University of Sussex. And uh, he, he, they wrote this paper uh, uh, on uh, legged Takagi equations, which governs the uh, spin dynamics of the uh, uh, superfluid helium. So earlier, a little earlier than this, uh, there's a famous uh, legged equation for spin dynamics. And this, then you can predict the, uh, the uh, NMR uh, oscillation frequency. But then with adding this uh, relaxation, dissipation term, now you can, for example, discuss the width of NMR peaks. Uh, you can predict and analyze this. Uh, in the, so, so this is the Leggett Takagi equation. And uh, Takagi san is uh, here. Where? OK, here. And, and this photo was taken two days ago. OK, so then uh, before this, uh, uh, while uh, Tony was in uh, Tokyo, uh, the graduate student, uh, Takagi, uh, wrote this uh, paper, uh, encouraged by Tony, uh, the susceptibility discontinuity at the helium-3 uh, A phase normal transition. So uh, Jim Souls uh, told us that uh, for helium uh, A phase, it equals spin pairing phase because uh, the night shift or the uh, spin susceptibility uh, doesn't change as you go from normal state to uh, super, superfluid A phase. Then eventually at lower temperature, when you go to B phase, there's a jump, and then there's a reduction in the susceptibility. Uh, however, if you really magnify this uh, region, uh, there should be actually a jump in the opposite direction. And then this uh, is uh, calculated uh, by, uh, predicted by uh, Takagi-san. 
And it, this value is about uh, 10 to the 3. Uh, so it's very tiny. And uh, this, uh, then, uh, this idea was uh, adapted for strontium-2 ruthenium-04 uh, 40 years later uh, by Miyake and the uh, Journal of Physical Society of Japan. And the essence is that uh, you need a uh, density of state depending on energy. This is needed. So for spherical Fermi surface like helium-3, its uh, density of state is proportional to uh, square root of E, right, for three dimensions. And now strontium ruthenate to ruthenium-04, the superconductor we discovered, uh, had a, a Bahnhof singularity of this, uh, the, the gold quasi two-dimensional band, uh, a little uh, higher than the Fermi surface. So, <clears throat> so then uh, this uh, uh, density of state uh, uh, is expected to have a ra la uh, rather strong uh, energy dependence. So in this case, uh, if you apply the uh, magnetic field, then it become green. So the, uh, uh, because of this Zeeman splitting, the density of state of one band, say spin down band, has a, a larger density of state. And then it becomes superconducting because density of state is higher. So the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, energy gap, superconducting energy gap is supposed to be high, uh, larger. So that creates a more uh, flow of electron from positive to negative. So that will give you additional uh, spin polarization compared with the uh, uh, normal state. <coughs> So therefore, and then, so this is, this alpha is, uh, give, governs this uh, energy dependence of the density of state. And then this is the expected uh, uh, enhancement in the susceptibility. Here is alpha. <coughs> okay, so this, uh, there's NMR measurements, uh, 2015, uh, by Ishida, uh, our, my colleague. Uh, they did a very, very careful uh, NMR measurements and then, uh, so for this is the night shift, the spin susceptibility. And uh, if you lower the, temp uh, the magnetic field, go into the, low, go into the uh, superconducting state, then uh, the night shift, it's very tiny, but 2%, but it, it's going to go up. For spin singlet superconductivity, uh, it should go down. So it's in the opposite direction. And also, this uh, is become more uh, significant at lower field. It has nothing to do with this, uh, uh, the voltage. Uh, anyway, it's it become bigger than the normal state. <coughs> OK, so then uh, for uh, half quantum voltage state, <coughs> this, uh, the, you know, the in integer voltage state uh, involves the uh, phase change of 2 pi as you go around the singularity. So what's, what's shown here is that the color is uh, supposed to be the orbital phase. Okay, and then from red to coming back to red, so you have a phase change of 2 pi. And the vertical scale is the uh, uh, magnitude of the uh, uh, size of the uh, superconducting gap. Right? So this is the integer uh, uh, voltage. Now, uh, for half quantum voltage is uh, possible <clears throat> if you have a spin degree of freedom, like a spin triplet superconductor. And then, especially, uh, so this, uh, this arrow here now is the spin part, okay? So this is a D vector. So if your D vector changes by pi, so it starts from uh, pointing up and coming back, pointing down, the D vector, the Cooper pair spins are uh, perpendicular to the D vector. Then the, the, this uh, uh, red and blue shows the same physical state, except the face of the, the spin. Uh, component is uh, different by pi. So then if you have additional uh, orbital uh, phase change of pi instead of 2 pi, then you satisfy the uh, single valueness of the wave function around this uh, singularity. So this is a uh, half quantum voltage, and this uh, orbital phase is coupled with the uh, external magnetic field, the flux. So this will give you half quantum voltage. And this is uh, equivalent uh, to say that uh, spin up up has a uh, one uh, circulation, and the spin down down has no circulation. Okay, it's the equivalent uh, way of uh, saying it. Now, if this uh, equal spin pairing uh, uh, half quantum voltage happens, then the spin up up particles are moving ra rather. Uh, you know, it has to it has to move. There's a velocity, and then down down doesn't have to have a velocity. 
And so, and then also Majorana fermion is uh, ex anticipated, expected around this uh, vortex core. Now here is this uh, 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 Bakaliuk and the Leggett uh, theory in 2009. And so they call this uh, spin polarization, kinematic spin polarization. So there's a new spin polarization, uh, new uh, stability mechanism acting only for a uh, half quantum voltage state. That is because a uh, half quantum voltage has a different velocity of the uh, spin up, up, and down, down. So this means that there's a kinetic energy. This is energy is higher. So you have a, a more population in the lower energy state. Then, uh, and then they are spin polarized. So if you then put a magnetic field, then uh, this uh, big energy become lower and then you have more uh, population. So this, this mechanism doesn't uh, work uh, for the full integer voltage state. So this will give you additional stability mechanism for half quantum voltage only. So uh, application of H, this is uh, needed for the quantization. And then you have additional uh, uh, horizontal magnetic field <coughs> could uh, stabilize the half quantum voltage state. So this experiment was done in Illinois, uh, Rafi Budakian's group in 2011. The, uh, the crystal, the tiny crystal was uh, provided from our group uh, from Kyoto. And this is the measurements of uh, 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 torque or magnetization uh, using this uh, Chianti liver. And then you see the red one uh, shows the uh, integer uh, quantization. And all the yellow cur curves are uh, with additional uh, uh, magnetic field to stabilize the uh, half quantum voltage state. So here is no uh, horizontal field. And if you add the horizontal field, you have a, a half a quantum step over here, as uh, expected. <clears throat> so we are trying to reproduce this uh, with a, a more accessible uh, measurement technique. And this is a little box experiment. And so right around the, the little box experiment is uh, uh, for the, if you apply the magnetic field, the fluxoid changes, and then uh, the, when, when, when there's a current uh, to uh, satisfy the quantization uh, uh, condition, the, because of this energy, uh, superconducting transition temperature, Tc, goes down a little bit. So as a function of magnetic field, Tc should oscillate. So if you are in the middle of the uh, transition, resistive transition, and measure the voltage or resistance, the resistance go up and down. Okay, so this is the measurement. And here's the voltage. And then we, we have this blue one is a single crystal, and we attach uh, a silver paint, and then we FIB, the focus ion beam, uh, we, we shape this to make a ring of uh, like one micrometer size. And uh, we can make uh, uh, multiple rings if we wish. Uh, we, we establish a rather good technique to do this. And my, um, sec my next speaker, uh, uh, Indu, may talk also about this. Uh, uh, kind of experiment from their own group. And oh, here is the uh, little box uh, quantization, okay, the peak, resistance peak. And then uh, uh, this peak with the horizontal additional field will split into two peaks. So which used to be the peak become now the uh, dip negative, right? So, so this we, we believe in is the uh, evidence for the half quantum voltage state. Okay, so now, uh, then uh, more recently, uh, 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 well, af after this uh, uh, series of lectures in 1973-74, uh, he then have a visit uh, to uh, University of Tokyo. And uh, Hiroshi Fukuyama uh, uh, gave me these uh, two biographs uh, to show you, uh, to uh, show uh, uh, Tony's affiliation uh, uh, with uh, the University of Tokyo. And uh, so Tokyo and Kyoto has a really rival rivalry. So since uh, the, the name of their university is the University of Tokyo, so our university is Kyoto University, okay. not the University of Kyoto. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Kyoto means capital, okay. And Tokyo means uh, East Capital, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, so since uh, Kyoto has been the capital for, in Japan for 1,000 years, uh, people in Kyoto, like me, still believes that uh, 
you know, our emperor is uh, tentatively visiting Tokyo. And he will <laughs> soon come back. But uh, for 150 years, uh, they never come back. So, okay. So, okay. So then, uh, 2005 and 2010, we have a national uh, uh, project, uh, uh, super clean materials, uh, helium and also uh, strontium lucinate and other magnetic materials. And Masahito Ueda, uh, he, he, yeah, he has been a, he was a, a postdoc of Tony at here around uh, 1996, and then uh, to 98. And then uh, uh, also, I am uh, the, also the member of this uh, project. And uh, he was uh, the international advisor of this project. And then uh, he got uh, uh, honorary doctorate uh, from Tokyo. And then uh, he gave a, a congratulatory uh, address at the graduate school entrance ceremony of the University of Tokyo. Okay, so he has this uh, affiliation. And then uh, he gave a series of lectures uh, at the University of Tokyo. And uh, this is a message from Hiroshi. Congratulations on your 80th anniversary from the anniversary. Uh, from, uh, and then he, uh, Tony will uh, visit again uh, uh, soon uh, to Tokyo for QFS uh, meeting. And I heard that Dr. Saudes also uh, come to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to Japan. <coughs> uh, sorry, Kosteris. Sorry, Kosteris. And then uh, 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 Tony uh, gave a, a lecture in uh, Kyoto. Uh, this is a uh, uh, two lectures. Uh, we asked uh, this uh, Nobel Prize uh, lecture, uh, Superbly Healing Three, as well as this uh, uh, the public lecture, uh, the uh, Why Can't Time uh, Run Backwards? And uh, he gave this. Uh, and this uh, lecture is now available at the, uh, in the YouTube. So if you Google OCW Legate. And this is available. <clears throat> okay, then uh, uh, after the, uh, this uh, super clean <coughs> project, uh, the, we, we have this uh, topological quantum uh, uh, material phenomena project uh, with, with uh, myself as a national leader. And after these five years, and then we have this uh, uh, topological material science project uh, uh, led by uh, Kawakami. And so Tony has been the uh, international advisor for all three national projects. So for 15 years, so he comes to, to uh, uh, international conferences uh, organized by these uh, national projects on uh, helium-3 and uh, topological materials. And then uh, uh, we are organizing this uh, TopoQ uh, international network, and uh, we have a collaboration uh, from with the Japan, this uh, uh, Norios project with uh, uh, EPICS program from USA, and uh, then uh, in Canada, the CIFA program. And then uh, uh, Tony has a, uh, is a director of uh, the institute at uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University and with the INDU. So uh, we have uh, this uh, collaboration also and the Max Planck Institute as well. So we ex extend this uh, international topological uh, quantum phenomena uh, network. And then, uh, in uh, 2020, uh, we are hosting the uh, low temperature conference. This is just advertisement uh, in, in Sapporo, and one week after the Tokyo Olympics. And uh, Sapporo is a uh, in Northern Ireland. So if, if this is in uh, uh, August, but uh, the, it should be rather comfortable. And uh, Naoto Nagaosa and myself will be the uh, co-chair of this uh, LT conference. So uh, we really hope uh, Tony and uh, many of the uh, participants will, co will come to Sapporo. Uh, then uh, then uh, Tony uh, uh, did uh, at least two more important accomplishments while he was in Kyoto, and he learned Japanese. So he now was uh, ready to uh, meet uh, Haruko-san in Sussex uh, six years later, uh, then, whom uh, he, he married to. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, this another accomplishment. Okay, so then uh, 
during his stay at the Yukawa Institute, I told you that the Yukawa Institute uh, edit, edit and published this uh, uh, progress of theoretical physics journal. And uh, so uh, he, he uh, proofread and revised and possibly rewrote <laughs> the entire papers <laughs> written by Japanese uh, for this uh, journal. And uh, so he, uh, he uh, uh, put this, uh, he wrote this uh, column essay uh, to uh, uh, Physics Today counterpart in Japanese physical society. And later this uh, was uh, uh, published as a, as a book, part of the book, which is very well uh, known. And then, uh, so this is on the contrasting uh, Japanese and English cultures and rhetorics for scientific English. And so maybe in addition to grammar and uh, you know, structure mistakes, the, the serious uh, uh, problem he encountered must be this uh, difference in rhetoric. And this is a uh, uh, flow in Japanese writing. And uh, so, uh, we, okay, so you are the passengers of the airplane, you get on the boat, and I'm the pilot, and I don't tell you where I'm going. And you don't know what your destination is, what the conclusion of this talk is. And then uh, you start flying, and then you see from the window some scenery, and next time you see entirely different scenery. And sometimes maybe the airplane is flowing backward, right? <laughs> and then eventually, uh, five minutes left for my talk, you start to realize where the destination is. Maybe we are going to Sapporo, okay? And then, uh, so this is the flow of uh, Japanese uh, uh, rhetoric. So here, you don't know the destination, and the talk is like this and like this. And towards the end, you start to see what the conclusion is. But the pilot never told you exactly where you're going. And then, so the pilot tried to, to uh, convince you where you are going. And you realize it yourself. Okay. But uh, so if you notice, uh, today I arranged or I uh, uh, dis disarranged my talk in this way. So I put this as much as possible. So then uh, near the end, uh, then uh, here is a uh, legged tree, okay? So, uh, so in the, he said that only B is allowed for scientific papers in English. And note also that the number of branches is smaller. So here you state clearly where this plane is going to fly to, and then you state your conclusion, and then uh, you, you said something to support your conclusion. And you always come back to your clear conclusion. And this should be the way the scientific paper should be written. But uh, you know, Japanese uh, literature and uh, way of thinking is like this. So uh, this was a serious problem. But, uh, so, but this uh, 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 legacy tree was introduced by the book by uh, Kinoshita Horio on the scientific writing. This is a long time best selling book. And because of this, uh, this uh, legacy tree has been really widely known. Not, not only for college uh, uh, education, educators uh, for English, but also uh, here I put, uh, so if you look at Google and then put Japanese legato, okay, then uh, you, you get all these photo pictures, right? And this is uh, the handout of the Japan University Association for Computer Education Workshop. And they talk about Legate Tree. And then here is by linguist, and this is by engineer. He has his own uh, version of it. And this is by uh, medicine, and this is pharmacy. <laughs> so, so this is the uh, flow. So you see, the, it's flying backwards, right? So, <laughs> So uh, therefore, this is a summary. So this is a legged tree. Uh, it can stand up and then grow you know, to, the, to the sky. Uh, this way, uh, it never uh, go, go stand up. So, uh, so this is sort of a summary. OK. So then, uh, uh, Tony, thank you for all your influence on us. And uh, happy birthday. Happy Sanju. And uh, let me say it in Japanese. Uh, legged sensei, Sanju Makotoni, omedetou gozaimasu. あの、すいながくご活躍ください。
question. In English or Japanese is fine. Japanese. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, yeah, here, uh, so Kinoshita, uh, name it, uh, what is it? Gyakumugi, this is this, this is the name uh, given to this uh, Japanese tree by Kinoshita. Sakamogi type. It's an uh, upside down uh, tree. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, uh, upside down growing tree. Maybe you have a, maybe you should name this, uh, this version. <laughs> you didn't give the name to this uh, Japanese tree in your, Sakamogi. Any other questions? Oh, oh one over here. From... Well, I looked up legged tree, I found them. You get a tree who drives through it in California. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, you need to put it in Japanese, legetto. <laughs> All right, let's thank uh, the speaker again, please. Thank you, uh... So I, we need some help with the IT over here, please. Uh, um, um, Yoshi, sir? Yeah, microphone. All right, our, our next speaker is uh, Ying Liu from PSU Shanghai, and uh, there's the title. So, thank you. All right. So, I want to uh, first thank uh, Tony and uh, all the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Um, I have a, a long title, so um, learning physics from and working with Tony in the US and China. So the, the other part will be apparent. Um, okay, so. so I'm uh, at both Penn State and, uh, and uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So when I show up here, actually, uh, People, uh, uh, for those who know me, were confused because uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, first, not a theorist. Second, I'm not from UIUC. So how my connection with Tony actually started by being Tony's students, uh, real students. In, this, uh, in the course, Tony um, uh, offered at the uh, University of Minnesota and uh, the home of uh, Golden Gophers, and so Tony was a visiting professor as, at ITP, University of Minnesota, in March to June. That's a spring quarter uh, at, uh, at U. And uh, Tony's call, um, uh, the course is entitled Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. So this is, uh, this is my note. So I'm a note for uh, one of those courses. But that was so. That was not the first time I heard from uh, Tony. So this is uh, the very first time that I listened to uh, Tony's uh, colloquium in 1990. So this is uh, the time when uh, high TC superconductivity was just discovered. And uh, also at the time, supposedly cold fusion was also possible. So Tony actually started with uh, his coquin with an analysis of cold fusion uh, when, and they're saying that this is uh, not likely. So that's how I got to know uh, Tony. But from all these experiences at the University of Minnesota, what I learned that is uh, quantum is hard and quantum theory is harder. So I was uh, very content that I only need to worry about experiments. So I, I did not go into the theoretical physics, but I finished my PhD thesis 
and uh, Professor Alan Goldman working on superconductor insert transition, quantum phase transition. Um, so I did not quite escape um, quantum, um, but I did not have to worry about theory. Then I thought I don't have to worry about theory at all until I become a system professor at uh, Penn State in 1994. And that was uh, actually a you know, interesting opportunity uh, because that was a time when uh, Yoshi and uh, the company discovered superconductivity in strong uh, ruthenate. So this is the nature paper. That was uh, interesting material because this is uh, the only uh, layered power viscous superconductor that becomes uh, uh, superconducting without copper. So that was their title. However, the thesis really no. And uh, so I was actually you know, very interested in this, uh, in this material and trying to get some funding to do this. But uh, what I was told is that uh, at the time, the, the highest TC superconductor was over 100 Kelvin. And I was asked why they should fund me to do something much, much lower. But the reason eventually it turns out is that you know, this may be a very special superconductor. So this, first of all, the, the normal state is very similar to helium-3. And so we know that uh, the, the normal, from high TC superconductor, the normal state uh, is very important. So this is some of the effective mass. This is the susceptibility. And the, most importantly, the Wilson ratio is 1.7. It's very close to the helium-3. And then there's also two theoretical papers that saying uh, explicitly that this could be something just like uh, helium-3. So I knew, I knew very little about helium-3. So because I want to do this, then I look it up. And so this was the, I think uh, at the time, uh, the mass rate uh, paper is Tony, Tony's review article in Review of Modern Physics. Uh, this is not the, so, so it looked to me pretty complicated. So, um, so I, but, uh, you know, be, so I had uh, to spend time to, to read this. And this was actually before the, before the Nobel Prize was, uh, was awarded. So I was very happy. Actually, I did do some reading and some study so that uh, when the Nobel Prize, the first Nobel Prize on helium-3, and then people already mentioned that you know, seven years after, then the, the omission was uh, corrected. So this, so at the end, I still have to learn some theory. And uh, so, because it is an electronic analog of um, of helium three, and then therefore the this is the specific um, pairing symmetry that could be possible. So this is written down by Rice and Sigrest, uh, based on the two assumptions. Of course, you have to stay within this space group of D four H. Then, if you make two more assumptions. First is uh, superconductivity is in 2D in nature. Basically, all the parameter does not depend on Kc, K, K being the uh, uh, crystal um, vector. And then, so, so then a lot of things is uh, we assume strong spin orbital coupling because the band structure, most, the, the Fermi surface is mostly determined by the ruthenium, so this is reasonable. Anyway, so these are the five possible parent states. And, uh, and for the, for the or minus five, this is particularly interesting because this is a chiral, so-called chiral P wave corresponding to the helium-3 A phase. So what we learned from uh, the high TC work is the, um, oh, oops, is the, um, to, to determine whether this is indeed a, uh, electronic analog of um, helium-3, then we need to determine the pairing symmetry. So we know from the high TC work that the phase sensitive measurement based on Josephson coupling is the most effective one. So this is the Josephson coupling between a, 
S wave and P wave, this is supposed to be vector. It didn't show quite show up. And if you look at this, this is the spin single S wave auto parameter. This is uh, um, P wave auto parameter. N is as shown here in this famous uh, gas ground locking brown paper. And that uh, this is the just the, the norm vector. So if you look at this, then you will quickly, this just means the average over Fermi surface, some kind of special average. This is really just having to do with a long zero uh, spin uh, optical coupling, because if there were low spin optical coupling, then this will be, spin will not, uh, will be a good quantum number, then there'll be low Josephson coupling. So uh, it's, actually, it's actually hard to give a talk in this occasion because you know, a lot of audience, the authors are in the audience, so you have to also worry that the way you get everything right. <laughs> but um, I hope I do. And uh, so then what we're trying to do is that uh, is we're trying to do this uh, GLB experiment. So for this, what you do is you do a hybrid squid structure, and then you have S wave and the P wave, and you look for two experimental signatures. First one, there's a spontaneous, uh, spontaneous uh, flux trapped in here. If you can measure this flux, you, you will find that. Another thing is that you have a minimal uh, in the quantum oscillation at a zero total flux. This will be a minimal instead of maximum. So we started with some initial, uh, initial um, success in Josephson test. Um, so as you can see from here, if you have a single Josephson junction with the, the norm of this in the same direction as a D vector, then what you have is the, the Josephson coupling will be zero. So we did the one experiment, and then what we find is the Josephson uh, coupling is zero along the c-axis, and the implant is finite among implant. So this would be consistent with the so-called gamma-5 state with the d vector along the z-axis. So we're very happy to feel that we're in the right track because there were other evidence suggesting that gamma-5 was the right state. However, when we're trying to, you know, this way, I worked on this for, for a long time, and so, but then for the first few years, this experiment refused to work. First, it's very hard to get just a coupling. To begin with, for this one, we, put, we did a press the Indian, which is the quickest and easiest experiment. But to do a squid structure, then it's not so easy. And then another thing is that uh, the flux trap is, uh, is really a trouble. So we were very, um, this is very troubling. And then it came, so it came to uh, 2001. After that, at that time, I have already spent with uh, uh, one of my students and working with uh, uh, Yoshi uh, to well, spend four or five years to do on this experiment. So this is uh, 2001, that year right after I got a uh, tenure. And so Tony came to Penn State to deliver the Murray lecture in November, November 14th, 2000, 2001. So I was complaining to, um, I was complaining to Tony that this experiment is, uh, is really discouraging because we sometimes get a, a results, sometimes we don't. And then you know, this is, uh, it is trouble, it's troubling. So Tony listened to uh, what I had to say uh, in my office and then told me that this was precisely what he expected. I said, wow. So I said, then I asked her, why? So Tony explained to me, but uh, I did not understand. So I really did not understand. And so I asked, because I only have 40, 45 minutes. And so I, I asked Tony if he can, you know, if he has a, a paper on this. He says, of course I have this paper, you know, then I, but uh, then I will send the reference to you. This is November 14th, right? So then after that, after he went back, came back to Urbana, he did. So I just realized this paper actually is published several years ago already. And it is a Philosophical Magazine B, 1996. Uh, 
This is, uh, I think, is uh, for the occasion of 70th birthday of the Professor David Pines. So I actually do not know this paper. And so what I had to do is this is Tony's present to, for me for the Thanksgiving reading. So instead of having, uh, having uh, you know, enjoy the, the, the turkey and the pie, uh, apple pie, I had to, you know, I was sitting down to read this paper. And then I quickly find this uh, comment in the paper. So this is after discussing and, uh, the, uh, the, the D-wave corner junction experiment. This is, is um, w um, what uh, was performed uh, here um, by, by Dell. So then somewhere in the, in the paper third page, so then this is about uh, uh, the paper, the, the um, GLB paper and ask, why hadn't someone else tried the experiment, either for heavy fermion or YBCO before Dell did? This, you know, this is what I add here for the D wave. Then I think the answer probably has to do with the fact that both the original paper of GLB, which I just showed, and the most of the subsequent work connected with it rely heavily on the arguments which require exact symmetry of the circuit architecture and the light of, and the light and the experimentalist. I was an experimentalist, or I still am, uh, who seriously co contemplated doing it in real life, and uh, I was in real life, rapidly convinced him or herself that a, a symmetry certain to be present in real life experiment will make the results meaningless. That's, you know, that's, very, that's very serious. So, and, Everybody told me that you know, Tony, Tony is never wrong. So, but then I, I'm, in, I'm in trouble, right? So I've been work, spending four or five years in this already. And this is after one postdoc and the one graduate student in the fourth year. So I said, gosh. Yeah. But then I realized, actually, that's a good thing, that I had, I had my tenure already. So I said, well, I'm just going to do it because that's what the tenure for. So I decided I, I did not to take a sabbatical and uh, so we just go get this experiment. So several years after, we finally got a result. So this is, the, um, this is the sample geometry we have. Remember, this is uh, the, the GLB uh, experiment is opposite phase, right? You want to have uh, 180 degree. So this is a crystal. And this is the one, just a junction number one, just a junction number two. So this is a square gold index s wave superconductor. And this is the real sample. So what we can manage to do is we can have, you know, we really have the Joseph's coupling. This uh, IV curve has a zero, has a zero, uh, zero voltage, right, supercurrent. And we also have this uh, um, uh, quantum oscillation. This is a good quantum thing, And the period corresponds to the size of our, our uh, squid. So that was all very nice. And so then what we end up showing is as predicted that you know for the opposite GLB this uh, squid, what we have is that you know we have quantum oscillation, and then eventually, if this at a different temperature, the quantum oscillation reaches minima when the temperature is close to Tc. There's a technical reason for this uh, that we need to look at the close to Tc. The reason is. This junction and this junction are not the same, and typically because it's very hard to actually get a just, just a junction to begin with. So only when you're close to TC, when both supercurrent are small, is the external flux close to the total flux. So, so that's expected. And so this is what uh, just was predicted for the um, P wave. And then if you have a corner junction, as uh, you know, as Dell did, then for the for YBCO, and then we have um, here as well. This is because it's a P wave, so it's a 45 or it's a 90 degree phase shift for corner junction. So we have not, not a maximum, not minimum. And then for this control experiment, we have a maximum at a zero flux. When we later on have a better data for this uh, ramp junction, as you can see here, this is really small, really the maximum. So, what, uh, based on this, what we managed to show is that uh, the, 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 you know, if we assume that uh, 
phase order prime, the the superconductor order parameter is PC or or KC dependent, independent, then then are then there's a phase change of order parameter uh, by pi if you you know under inversing and the pi over two for the ninety degree uh, rotation. So this paper was eventually published in two thousand four. So so this correspond to uh, this uh, uh, gamma five stats shown here, kx plus and minus iky. And I want to emphasize this is actually not a set of the issue. One of the, the, re, one of the question is uh, this has domains, uh, k plus ik and k minus ik has domains. But, and the, in all, what uh, the structure we have is uh, a bulk structure. But what the domain will do is it will increase the energy. The domain walls is a finite energy. And uh, typically, in the 2D or 3D dimension, that uh, the entropy gain by the domains do not compensate the increase in the uh, free energy. Now come back to, um, to Tony's um, uh, original uh, statement. And uh, unfortunately, um, so I, will, I, I, I do not have time to go over uh, this, uh, how we can understand uh, Tony's argument. But we're very fortunate to, um, to find uh, a way to uh, make this work uh, experimentally. So, um, what I want to so, what I want to do now is uh, after telling the story, I want to switch to uh, another uh, subject, which is uh, Tony's uh, global uh, uh, impact. What I'm showing here is that uh, um, this is a list of. Uh, PhD students and the postdocs uh, supplied by, by Tony. So these are now North American, America, now Western Europe, UK, international students, starting with uh, Sussex. So I noticed that uh, you know, there's African and uh, Middle East students, but no, no Chinese. But starting with Illinois, this is the, you know, there was quite a few, uh, with actually Ping, Ping is here, and uh, students, and the long list of uh, international students, and uh, postdocs as well. And I think this is a, a real testimony for um, Tony's uh, global impact for training uh, so many uh, students who are now you know, working uh, uh, worldwide. But what I want to uh, focus today, um, my task, I, I understand, is to focus on, on China. In particular, to focus Tony's uh, work in Shanghai, which is here. And here, Beijing is here, so we're in the south part. And uh, also, in particular, focus on university that uh, is called Shanghai Jiao University, as they had two campuses, is here. So these are the, where, where the, uh, the location. So I want to uh, begin uh, to dis discuss uh, Tony's uh, work in China, began by um, his work, uh, his visits to China. So Tony first visited China in 1982, when first graduated from, from college. So, uh, oh, oops. So I think this actually, Osako did not go. Um, so this is the very first time Tony went to China, and uh, uh, so these are the cities uh, Tony stopped by. Second time is not clear. This is according to uh, Haruko, it's 2005-2006, and Tony went to visit alone. And the third time is the, the whole family uh, went to visit in 2008. So then, Two, more, two years after, Tony went to visit uh, um, China in, uh, in Shanghai. This is the first time Tony went to visit Shanghai Jiao Tong University, arranged by Ping. And uh, Tony gave a, um, his, uh, a big lecture, and he donated the, the honor to fund a fellowship. The fifth visit is the, the very first time I was involved, Tony visited over a weekend. And uh, I don't quite remember 
it's a July, but don't remember which day. And then that was the time we, we discussed to establish a center, and we came up with the name of the center, Shanghai Center for Complex Physics. And then since then, and 2012, Tony did not visit, but since 2013, Tony has been visited uh, Shanghai twice a year, um, first in January for about a week and four weeks in the summer. And then since 2017, since last year, um, Tony's been visiting twice, but the uh, first two weeks in January, two months in the summer. So we're very happy Tony um, decided to, uh, to adopt uh, SJTU as his second academic home. So we're very honored. Now I want to say a few words about Shanghai Jiao University. This is the second academic home for Tony. And so this is one of the oldest and the most prestigious universities in, in mainland China. It was established in uh, 1896. So Shanghai is the most international city starting the way back. This is old Shanghai still exists, still there, the old Shanghai. And the new Shanghai, this is the uh, tallest building in, in China. And uh, with all the things, this is the campus. And uh, this is a new uh, science complex. So physics building will be here. So, so Tony's office will be somewhere on the eighth floor here. We, we, we have not moved. We'll be moving towards the end of the year. So what is uh, the center we're trying to build? So I want to take this opportunity to introduce this is Shanghai Center for Complex Physics. This is not complex system physics. It's a complex physics. So what, we, what Tony had in mind was we're going to uh, combine theoretical, this is uh, Tony Rodis, theoretical and experimental techniques drawn both from traditional condensed matter physics and from the newer field of quantum information. So basically, we're studying the interface, the intellectual interface between the condensed matter physics and, uh, uh, and uh, quantum information. So it's uh, quantum complex physics. And uh, we, you know, Tony gave a few examples. For example, the, the properties of new quantum materials possessing interesting complex physics, sub, such as topological insulator, topological superconductors, high temperature superconductors, and the other strongly entangled melting body system. And also we want to uh, teach. So currently this is uh, the, the center is on the top floor of this physics building. And so this is what you can see from outside Ziyan College, where Tony, uh, the student that where Tony teach is uh, uh, in this building. And this, from this, uh, the center, you look out the window, this is what you see. The center has an international uh, advising committee. And uh, so this is other individuals who are serving on the committee, including uh, Yoshi, who is here. And the Lang, the, these are the funding members. Jing Feng and I are official delegation for, for Tony's 80th birthday celebration. So we're both here. And uh, so you know, we had uh, working uh, very hard to build up our uh, center of excellence. I want to take this opportunity to show that we also do experiments. So this is, uh, this is my lab uh, in Shanghai. I uh, have obviously a lab in, at the, uh, Penn State as well. So for this new lab, we have crystal growth back here. I call it uh, the dirty room. We have a lightened dilutional frigid, which is here with a, with a vector magnet, 10 millikelvin, which is rich. Um, a, a, a couple of months ago, well, we, I just ran this a couple of months ago. That was the base temperature currently. And then we also have a PPMS here. Uh, so here, PPMS with a uh, dilution insert, and they have a clean room that we do all the devices 
with the photolithography, but not ebonlithography. So we do experiments as well, and these are the, the couple of years ago, the, the students. And uh, one of the things Tony enjoys doing and is uh, teaching. So we have in Shanghai, which is, you know, thank for, for Dell for funding this too, a joint course. So this is the title of the course called the Basic Aspects of Superconductivity. And these are the uh, subject Tony uh, decided to give. This actually, every lecture is uh, two periods. So we have 14, about two weeks, uh, two or three weeks uh, uh, lectures, which are here. And actually, I, I hope that Tony will eventually turn this uh, into a, a little book. And, uh, and the way us, us have a, com a, a experimental course, which is just basically a supervised a lab a research project to go with this that is uh, taught by myself. And the way, you know, if you look at this, uh, these are the students, and you can see some of them are clearly not Chinese. And uh, this is because this is a joint course. So it's uh, student, the students taking this course are from SJTU, from Shanghai, clearly and then from uh, UIOC from here. And uh, it's been done twice already. Uh, five or six students will go to Shanghai, and then similar number of students will go uh, off of Penn State, will also go there. So we have this uh, and join the course. And students uh, obviously enjoyed learning the superconductivity in an international uh, setting. Tony has also helped being very generous in his time and to help um, hiring, so you know, this is the, the last information session and the recruiting uh, event. Tony also uh, participates, so he has participated several of these already, and so we're trying to uh, hire more people so that we can uh, tackle uh, some uh, fundamental problems. So right currently, this is the list of things we're trying to do and uh, so topological superconductivity, unconventional superconductivity, high temperature, possibly room temperature superconductivity, and the length for the quantum information, we're hoping to focus on the topological quantum information. Okay. And uh, I want to show a few pictures, then we'll be, no, I'll be done, sorry. Uh, so this is uh, some, Tony has to go through some official um, functions and uh, you know, sometimes uh, dealing with politicians. <laughs> and uh, travel a lot. And, you know, so this uh, whole thing, but it's around the dinner we did in Shanghai. Oh, Tony learned Chinese. So this is uh, Tony's Chinese tutor uh, with a Chinese book here. And, and uh, this some um, other, so we managed to get a, a house for, for Tony when, uh, when he comes. So this is... Uh, um, Haruko came last year, so this is the massage team. So Haruko got some Chinese massage. Uh, Asako is here, traveling here. This is Duen Huang and this is Xi Ang. It's uh, Asako on the camel, and this is today. Anyway, I'm done, so I want to use the last opportunity to, to wish Tony your happy 80th birthday and the very many uh, returns. This is the Chinese way we're saying it. Zhu Ning He Fu Ren Shou Bi Lang Shang Fu Lu Dong Hai. Translation, may you and Haruko live as long as Mount South. May your happiness be as vast as the Easter Sea. Congratulations. <laughs> it's an honor. Thank you so much. Sorry about it. Time for uh, one question or so. If anybody has one? Uh, I'm sorry. Right, right. So, and the uh, so for these Joseph's injunctions, uh, the square loop obviously is much larger. So that's determined a smaller period. 
And then the junctions are smaller, actually smaller and the most likely non-uniform. Those determines the modulation. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Actually, I'm going to use this to hold my girls' clothes. Never have pockets, so there we go. Okay. So where's the VGA? I have both. I'm I'm a professional. All right. So our final speaker for this session is uh, Laura Green, and he's going to talk about uh, Tony's advocacy in science diplomacy and human rights. And, wow, uh, it's a different color. Okay. Even, same color, right? No, I have a white background, but that's okay. All right, well, um, it's probably... Do you want me to use HDMI? No, 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 no. It's HDMI. Okay, let me get my HDMI connector. Actually, it's fine if it's green. Oh, really? I have an HDMI dongle. I'm a professional. <laughs> For that kind of MacBook? No, 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 no. I got a new MacBook. It doesn't work. So make sure you hook this up first here. There's an order to these things. Because these things are under standard firmware. So I was going to say my talk won't be too long, but anybody that says that, it's always a warning that it's going to last forever. Okay. <laughs> Woohoo! Okay. Well, I hope I'm not the full 30 minutes. So, um, first of all, I was like too worried to give a physics talk in front of all of you, so I decided to do something that I've really looked up to Tony for for a long time, which is the science, diplomacy, and human rights. And that's been, that was my theme as APS president, and I've been working in at least the, um, 40 years in the human rights aspect, and Tony's always been my hero. And I will tell you mostly near the end about what he's done with the Committee on Human Rights and the National Academy of Sciences. So what is science diplomacy? Science diplomacy is very simply using the words and the actions of science and communication between scientists to build a better world. So sometimes it's people working across borders and boundaries to make better water resources, energy, disease, but it's also important just to have the communication. Scientists tend to be staunchly non-political. Once in a while, if we had a little too many martinis, we kind of might get a little political, but we try to avoid it. And it's very, very, very important to remain staunchly non-political, to be able to run freely between borders and boundaries. And I'll also show that it's easy to enter in the human rights area. One of my favorite examples was Enrico Fermi won the Nobel Prize. He was very deserving. He probably deserved about 30 of them. Um, but his wife, Laura Fermi, was Jewish, and they needed to get out of Italy at the time. And it was designed that he get the Nobel Prize at that time. So scientists have a long history of human rights and science diplomacy. Oops. Um, so Tony was a leader in this. Even in the 1970s, as far as the science diplomacy part, he was giving lectures in Poland. And he was at the ninth uh, lecture uh, winter school in theoretical physics in Karpacz and in the 16th and 79. And this was organized by the physics department of the University of Warsaw. And he actually published his lectures. He's a better person than I am because I usually don't get to that. Um, some of more Tony's science diplomacy is that he just absolutely generously, beyond belief, goes around to many countries and gives lectures. You're not going to get a lot back if you go to Ghana. And, uh, and it's just really tremendous what he does, gives of his time. But developing and post-developing countries such as Singapore, and he's joined scientific groups to visit FSU, not Florida State University. Uh, so it's a 
uh, and in 1986. And more recently, he's spending about one, as we heard from Ying before, he's spending about one month a year in China and also about one month a year in Canada, which is right across our border, but it's getting harder and harder to get across borders. So one of the things that they're noted for is um, what we have is Paul Chu and Warren Pickett went with Tony Leggett, and they visited Sharif University and other places with Muhammad Akhavan, where Muhammad Akhavan is the physics department chair. And they had a really great visit. And the Asian Pacific Newsletter in August 2014 wrote an article about this that says, Breaking Boundaries and Stigma, Scientific Collaboration in Iran. And the Iranian physicists were feeling more and more separated from the rest of the world. It's hard to get the communication across. And in fact, um, Tony, along with Paul and Warren, wrote an article in Nature Physics in 2016. Iranian scientists are growing increasingly isolated because of political tensions between Iran and the West. We attempt to alleviate this problem through science diplomacy. And this is Mohammed's uh, magnetic research laboratory. And there's Mohammed there, and there's Tony, and Warren, and Paul. But in 2017, there was a major setback. And before we published this, we had Tony's comment on it, which was, we had planned, well, I'll just read this. This is from APS News, the one that just got mailed to you a week ago. At the 11th hour in September, the US, this is September of 2017, the US government blocked five, five scientists from four US universities, ourselves and three of our colleagues, from traveling to Iran. We had been invited to attend and present scientific lectures at the 10th International Conference on Magnetic and Superconducting Materials, MSN 2017. This is a conference that's been happening every other year since 1999. It's moved around the Middle East and other places and regions. It was in China. And it's not from one country. It's, it's a kind of a science diplomacy conference, OK? And uh, you know, I know people that have gone earlier. I was invited. I thought that was great, right? And all of a sudden, our universities contact us that we have to fill out these forms. We filled out all the forms. And I made sure that they knew that uh, I had two talks, and I posted them on the web. And I wasn't going to take, you know, everything's in the public domain. I promised I wouldn't take my computer, I wouldn't take my telephone, and I wouldn't check my email when I was there. And we were all denied by ITSAI, which is the Iranian Transactions and Sakens Regulations, even though finance has never been discussed. And I mentioned my husband, who was a musician, was going to come with me and give a concert, because they haven't had a concert in Tehran in years, someone told me. So, um, so he was also denied under ITSAR. So we asked if we could appeal. And they said, you could only appeal if things had changed dramatically. But in fact, we were already in complete compliance. So that didn't work. And here's a picture. I wanted to go so badly. Doesn't that look like fun? Anyhow, we're going to find another way to go there. And so this is our APS publications. And here's some of the players. And um, hardline on sanctions, harm science diplomacy. Uh, I think Warren's letter, we get the letter from the Treasury Department. And I think Warren's letter called him Professor Warren Davis or something. Wasn't that right? OK, yeah. So the whole thing, I mean, there was misprints. It was just decided a long time ago. So I wanted to mention, Ying did a much better job on this. He's got it together. But a lot of work in science diplomacy is also just interacting. And Tony's already just gone way out of his way to work with students and postdocs from all over the world. And in developing countries, um, I sort of asked him about that one day. And within, I mean, literally a day later, I, like he doesn't have enough to do, he sent me this list. I mean, he had it all down. I mean, I kind of reformatted it. but. Um, so it means he really knew it, he had it, it was all in front of his head, and he sent it right to me. So that was pretty impressive. So the next thing I want to go into human rights. So what Tony is, he's a member of the Committee on Human Rights, CHR, of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Math. They, it's not NAS anymore, it's NASEM, and they changed their name. This is actually bigger than you think. I hope I get that across. I'm going, yes? Medicine, didn't I say medicine? Oh, geez. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was actually, I came in late last night, and I was actually writing my talk over here in the morning. So um, uh, th this is called time reversal symmetry breaking when you give your talk 
after, I mean, you fix your talk after you give it. I've done that many times. Okay, so here's a case that happened, and I want you to know this, that we were contacted by a member, and some of these things happen by being contacted by members. This was a student of Ivan Schuler's, and Ivan's like sending me emails and saying, you've got to do something about that. Ali Basran was arrested in 2016 after the failed coup. He's put in jail, not given any charges, and then he's let out of jail, but after he's out of jail, they take away his ability to leave the country, and he's not allowed to work in science anymore. Um, so that's a problem. So uh, we wrote an earlier letter uh, when Homer was president about what was going on when people signed the, uh, you know, with the way they were treating people right after the coup. But what I was going to say that in September of 27, I wrote one directly to the Turkish president, the rector of the university where uh, uh, Ali was. And I just want to point out that in February we sent the letter and I went to Turkey the next week and I'm going to Turkey in a couple of weeks, so we'll see what happens. Um, so this is an, an example of the letters that we send. And I've learned a lot by being in Amnesty for 40 years is that you are staunchly non-political. You don't say anything except we're concerned for their health, are they getting their medicine, et cetera, et cetera. But then you blast the letters, right? This isn't just sent to one person and it's published all over. Here is a case that we're monitoring right now and I know Tony is working with the people, and this is one that we're really at the edge of our, it's very, very nervous. Um, even though, I can't remember how many people have been killed in Iran and some publicly, and Turkey and many other countries, somehow, I'm, I have the faces of everyone up here. You get someone, there are scientists, you get, and then scientists, many people like Tony, get passionately involved. So this poor guy was living full-time in Sweden, and, um, uh, uh, as the history goes, he was asked by the Iranian government to spy, and he said no. So at one visit when he came back to Iran, he was accused of spying for other countries, and they put him in jail. And so um, this has been going on since April of 2016, and many, many societies are involved, and it looks good, then it looks bad, then it looks good. And by the way, we have, I'll show you a picture. We had the first combined APS and AAAS letter to, to the Iranian president. And just very recently, Sweden granted him citizenship. So we'll see what happens. We'll continue to monitor. So I want to tell you that most of these cases, you work on these a lot. Go look at the Committee on Human Rights webpage. There's many, many cases. People work all the time. And there's very few successes. I'm going to move on to the successes now. Uh, oh, there's that picture thing from both APS and AAAS. That was the first combined letter that we did last year with the APS and the AAAS president. Okay, one success story. Ahmed Kokobi, I think most of you may be familiar about this. This is a guy that was working in UT Austin, and um, he went home to visit his parents uh, on some holiday, and um, what ha I forget what year that was. Um, anyhow, he went home to visit his parents, and the Iranian government said, what you're doing is useful for weapons. You need to stay here and work on weapons for Iran. And he says, I don't want to work on weapons. And they threw this kid in jail. And he was in jail for a couple of years, or longer than that. Again, I can't remember the year he was arrested. So the societies work together. So he won the Sakharov Prize in 2014 from APS. He won the Scientific Freedom and Responsibility uh, Award from AAAS. And then when we wrote him, we could say there's 50,000 people in the APS, actually 55 now, and there's 90,000 people in AAAS, and we're all scientists, and we just want to know how he's doing, et cetera, et cetera. And what happened to this poor kid is that he got very, very sick, and he actually developed kidney cancer. And he, was, uh, he went to the hospital for all, and he was going back home, and that's when the societies really started writing letters. You know, And there were many letters that went and said, can he just stay at home, et cetera, et cetera, and this is a success story. He is now free. Um, Tony is more effective, okay? I can't find too many successes, but Tony has been more successive, successful with his CHR. So I'm going to show you a free few things they call release articles, and the release articles are successes. So I just want to show you, if you go to the web page, this is the Committee on Human Rights, okay? And uh, I want to stress this. There are only 14 members. Okay, there are only 14 members. And they're currently monitoring 74 cases. Okay, and 78 cases were examined by UNESCO, and there were 67 positive results. 
And this is, I can't imagine the kind of amount of work that it takes to do this, because you can see I've done a few letters, and I thought they were time consuming. Every single word has to be right. Then you worry about it, and you get OKs. But this is really amazing. Egyptian medical doctor and computer engineer were granted presidential pardons. So this is an Egyptian vascular sur surgeon and a, a computer engineer. Along, they, had, they were arrested with 80 other prisoners in prison on charges related to their peaceful exercise of the rights to assembly and expression in Egypt. Okay? So these guys were finally released. You can read about the web page. Um, there's, this is one that was specific. I actually snooped behind Tony's back to get all this information. And um, I was told that this was very special to Tony because Tony had a student from Sudan who returned and, and took a, a teaching, is that spelled wrong? Teaching. It's a very calming teaching job. Um, and uh, he had challenges with the authorities, and he sadly died of a lymphoma in 2006. So this was really special for Tony. But um, uh, Dr. Mudwani Ibrahim Adem is an engineer. And he was just a human rights activist, the founder of the Sudan Social Democratic Organization, a non-governmental organization that promotes human rights, yada, yada, yada. And he was in jail, and he finally got released. Thanks to a lot for the Committee on Human Rights and the National Academies, which Tony plays a role. Here's an Iranian Canadian anthropologist, uh, Homa Hudfar, and her charges were never presented to her lawyer, and she was still arrested. But the press later on said in Iran that she was guilty of dabbling in feminism. So she's finally out of jail. Um, then there's a, a Turkish political scientist. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Itzar Gozyadin. Um, and uh, she posted information on social media criticizing the proposed reinstatement of the death penalty in Turkey. So just for saying we don't want the death penalty, she got thrown in jail. So we have to keep an eye on these things. And this is another success. She's out of jail. So I just want to finish quickly. There's, I could go on for hours, but we can hear more science, and I want to get back in time. So I want to thank this Committee on Human Rights and their huge amount of hard work that they work together as this concilian team to make these large successes. And happy birthday, Tony. This isn't dancing. So, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for that, uh, very uh, for talking about those very important uh, and often neglected uh, aspects of exactly. scientific life. Um, any questions for Laura or for Tony? I just say that uh, Laura uh, has. Um, uh, very, very uh, accurately, uh, I think, d describe the work of both of the APS and uh, of the Committee of Human Rights. But I think, frankly, her um, account of my own activities is probably a bit too glowing. <laughs> I think I, I, well, the I, members I, of your committee don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Nor does Becca, <laughs> who, who was the staffer. So, I mean, it, so one of the things that you find in these committees is that no one person can take credit for any one thing. It's safer that way. You can distribute it among 14 people or whatever. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's teamwork. And so he deserves all the credit. And I run into you when you're running off to Washington to go to another CHR meeting. So he's, you know, Tony, like I didn't really do that. The cat did it, you know, so. Actually, I have a question for both of you. Uh, why, why is the membership of the Committee of Human Rights uh, so small? I know there's many, many Academy members uh, signed the letters that are sent out and so on, but I, I was surprised to learn that there's only 14, yeah. uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, committee members. Uh, yeah, do you have something to say about No, that? I don't know the answer to that. And it might be because what, what they're trying to do is just empower the rest of the society to write the letters and, and do things like that. And also, the, the web page, I think it's open to everybody. If not, I'll give you the password. I think it's CHR. But you can just see how much has been accomplished. Um, and I think probably they also have to travel and get together once in a while. And if you have 40 people, then it's too expensive. I think that's probably the main, everything's driven by economics. But I also want to just ask you all to continue doing this. I mean, we have to worry about all of this. As you know, the United States has become noted in Amnesty International over the last several years. And uh, so we need to do this in other countries and just keep an eye on what's going on in all countries, whether it's the United States or Sudan. Eduardo? Yes. So, two years of this case is hard. The, the 
is another problem that I'm not sure if this committee addresses that, uh -huh. which is the issue of travel. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the serious problems of getting people from all kinds of nationalities to come mm -hmm. to conferences. The case of <laughs> Suchistra Sebastian comes to mind. It was denied, I suppose. Which is hysterical, because I see her in the MAG lab like once a right, month. But Actually, uh, when I'm over there. Right. So, yeah, so, so this is so this a really is a, important this is a point. Problem. Many people simply just don't come. I know. Okay. So uh, my first experience with this when I was uh, on IUPAP a bunch of years ago, um, and Indians were not allowed to come into this country because India had just tested the atomic bomb. And so we brought, I was on the Board of Physics and Astronomy, I can't even remember, the U.S. Liaison Committee for, for IUPAP, and we brought in people from state, and the answer was, we're not denying anybody, we're just busy. Okay, so there's nothing you can do. So when you're, when you run into someone that's denied, you really, there's nothing you can do. So you can go to the International Visitor's Office in the Academy, and if something is delayed, okay, they can help you with it. But otherwise, it's a brick wall. And all we can do is say, you know, we wrote a lot of letters for Shushitra, right? And I do that a lot. And, and, you know, you just do the best you can, but don't be quiet about it. And don't claim politics, just claim she does fundamental science, it's a fundamental science meeting. Don't say any politics at all, because it will come back and bite you. So just say, we are scientists, we want to talk about science, we can't just do it by Skype, because we need to sit around and draw pictures and have ideas together. And stress that all the time in your letters. Okay? But it's a huge problem, and we work on it a lot, and I don't know how to solve it, but we're going to keep working on it. Phil? Uh, I was just wondering what organizations uh, and individuals from other countries are doing similar work to you and, and to what extent you work with them. Well, Amnesty is international, and there's members of Amnesty all over the world. Besides other organizations, I'm not sure. I know that, I really don't know. I know that if you read about these cases, you'll see that other societies, you know, uh, other scientific societies will write and they'll be mentioned. Well, the Royal but Society. Probably. The Royal Society, absolutely. That's, that's right. Thank you. Who else? Come on. Yes. Yeah. Right, the, the, yes. CHR is actually a major component and, and it acts as the sort of secretariat. Okay, International Human Rights Network and the Royal Academy, Royal Society. Sorry, I knew that. Hi. Hi, hi. Uh, I was moved. This is Muhammad <laughs> Akhavan from Sharif University in Tehran. I was moved when you were uh, describing what you were doing in all around the world, especially in Iran. I just want to say I appreciate all you've done in science diplomacy. Thank and you. And you too. Thank and you. I appreciate what you have done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Ah, uh, yes. If somebody's sick? No, I mean, when you communicate with people, uh, are, are, are somebody who's communicating with you, are those people also the target of this kind of action? So, you know, what we hear, like in the case of Zaldi, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, the, the medical scientist who was living in Sweden, um, his brother and his family communicates with people right. and tell us how he was doing. So they communicate about... Uh, this is what their health is, this is the decision. And any of the emails that I've been privy to, mostly not that I'm getting them, but that someone else gets them and lets me see them, are all like, this was determined by the courts, this is how their health is, and, and no statement about this is unfair. Okay, just statement that this is, uh, you know, or no, no political statements. Okay, I didn't even know that. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? If not, let's thank Laura again. Okay.